You're listening to Don't Waste Water. It is changing dramatically. All the engineering calculation not worth the paper that they are writing on anymore. We have very aggressive events and we shall find some way to mitigate the events, but not the most extreme one. Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Twist for the podcast. Some CEOs of water utility always speak about innovation, but when you are listening carefully, they are not speaking about innovation. They are speaking about resilience because they would like to implement solution that will support them to be more resilient. And this is the big challenge. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, And in today's episode, I'm delighted to welcome Yossi Jacobi as my guest. Then started with the mandatory with the British, the UK, a line, first line or second line to Jerusalem. It was not enough. We put in place the third line to Jerusalem. It was not enough. Always with a bigger diameter always thinking that the new line will stay for 50, 70 years, 100 years, it's a joke. Never. Then come the fourth line. The fourth line was during the 90s. And we thought that this line will be enough for the next 50 years, at least the next 50 years, you know? We started the fifth line in 2005, and we hope that this line, which is a huge one, 100 inch and with big station, a 13.5 kilometer of tunnel in the mountains, that this line will support us for the next 100 years. I will tell you frankly, I don't think so. <laughs> we will have to build the next one. Yossi is the VP of Engineering at Mekorot. On February last year, we have in one day several issues. First of all, there was the headquake in Turkey and Syria. February. So there are several places in Israel that dozens of wells were out of operation because of tough turbidity. First thing. Secondly, we are in February. February is not a, a month with a lot of demand. It means that all the maintenance work of the national carrier is being done on February. So we were cut down with our parts of our national carrier. But on the same day, we had a big storm in the sea, not related to the earthquake. Big storm, winter, Barbara storm it was called, because I remember. And this storm caused a shutdown of four of the five big mega destination plants of the seashore. So imagine, we do not have wells, we do not have the main national carrier, we do not have the seawater desalination plant that supplies 60% of the drinking water of Israel. Mekorot is Israel's national water company and aims to turn concepts like blooming a desert or painting Israel green into a sustainable reality. Francis Bacon coined the term resilience long before it became Silicon Valley and entrepreneurship lingo. To him, it described the rebounding of echoes. Now, when we stick the word water in front of it these days, water resilience is not just about bouncing back. For a complex system like our water infrastructure to bounce back, it needs a lot of forcing, fortifying and designing of that system to be done before any major disruption happens to be ready to face it overcome it and bounce back. And one would need to live in a cave for a while to ignore that disruptions are piling up on the horizon. Hurricanes, floods, droughts, earthquakes, you name it, major environmental catastrophes have built, shaped and destroyed civilizations for as long as we can trace back humanity's history. But of course, what's changed is the pace in the new realm of climate change. Now, when it comes to water resilience, the good news is that we've built an arsenal of engineered solutions and best practices that have proven their efficacy across the ages, but also much more recently, across the rising numbers of catastrophes we're experiencing as humanity. I'm not saying the water brains have found a solution to tame any natural event into a trivial epiphenomenon, but there is still a lot we can do to manage the consequences and recover faster. What are these proven approaches, best practice and clever takes on resilient designs? Who's well placed to roll them out? How should water utilities all around the world take up the challenge? A few weeks ahead of a water resilience dedicated session at the upcoming Global Water Summit in London, I sat down with the gentleman who will moderate it. It's time for me to leave the floor to Yossi. As always, remember that if you like this conversation, the best way to help me and spread the word is to take this episode and share it with a colleague, a friend, your boss or your team, and I'll meet you on the other side. Sorry to interrupt again, this short host read to tell you that this could be your ad if we were to team up and become partners. 
Get your brand in front of an audience in 146 countries with the US, UK and Canada as the top three by the numbers on a podcast channel that's been repeatedly sustainability number one in Israel, Singapore and the Baltics, in the top 10 in France and the Nordics and almost continuously in the top 50 in the US, UK or Australia. Want to explore partnership options? Then reach out to Antoine at dww.show. The link is in the description and onto the podcast. Hi, Yossi. Welcome to the show. Hi. Good to be here. I'm super excited to take on the topic which we will be discussing today because I think it's a very timely topic and it's also a topic which is probably at the same time of high importance and overlooked by probably too many people. But before going heads first into the topic, I'd like to understand your path because when I looked you up, you have one of these rare profiles nowadays of someone who grew through the ranks of Mekorot. So that's the employer you've been with for your entire career. Today, you're a vice president of engineering, and I'm wondering, what are the learnings you made on that way? We're not talking about Mekuot, my home. I'm more than 25 years in the company. I started as an engineer, chemical engineer, process engineer. I didn't understand what is uh, salination. I learned a little bit in university, what is the wastewater side, starting working as a process engineer, a project ma a manager, understand a little bit about water supply because I started in our subsidiary, which is a waterware company. And then I came to Macaroth and I became the head of innovation of this company. You are taking all the understanding of the new startups. You are coming with your understanding and know-how, try to implement it to early stage companies. Afterwards, I had the chief of staff of my CEO. I learned how top management is working, how to work with the board, how to move a big ship like Macroot. And nowadays, as a VP of engineering, I'm trying to get all the things that I learned all over the way and to implement it. By the way, I'm still learning. You mentioned the, the big ship. Actually, it would be interesting to define Mekorot because it's Israel's national water company. But once we've said that, it's not obvious because you're not really a conventional utility than you would see like Haute Paris in France or something like that. What would be your elevator pitch to Mekorot? Mekorot, it's this country vision. We were established 12 years prior to the establishment of the state of Israel in 1937. When you are growing bigger than your country, you have some responsibility. You are the older one. So with the water, with the pet of the water all over the country, we built our town, communities, kibbutz, all kinds of communities, all kinds of industrial activity, and mainly all kinds of agriculture activity. So it's a big responsibility, but always, always struggling, always at the edge of a desert, always due to climate change. You have to find the new solution. Starting as others using agri first, and then the national carrier that was those days a unique project that taking water from the rich, it literally knows to the dry south, and it was not enough. And we started to drill for wells for 1500 meter depth, and then the salination and the reclaimed water. And now this all together with an integrate system that we are operating. It's not the end of the way. We always say that now we are safe and we have enough water, but no, there will be other cycles of droughts, other cycles of scarcity that we shall overcome. So our work will never end. And we always have to be pioneer in the way that they are thinking and the way that we are supplying solutions to our nations. By the way, to our neighbors as well. We'll go into that because I'm super curious about that. I just have one thing which I like to understand. To this date, the record holder for the number of appearance on that podcast is still Ravid Levy. He was here three times and the third time we specifically went into Israel as the water startup nation. And he referred several times at the role that Mekorot is playing in the fact that Israel is the water startup nation. How would you define that role, especially given your previous position when you were in charge of interacting with our startups. What's Mekorot roles in building that ecosystem? We really think that our challenge in our strategic plan is to build the ecosystem. There is a lot of solutions that were tested in our facilities and they were growing to a implementation in Israel and abroad. We think that we are the better side for all the water sector of Israel. Whenever you would like to test something, come to Mechorot and you will get the right place, right engineers 
that will support you. It is our mission. We think creatively, we think with innovating, and we are trying to support. We know that without Mekurot, your ability to grow and to go overseas is less than 30 or 50%. Working with Mekurot, with the exposure of Mekurot, there's a red carpet that will be in front of you in many places. When you say exposure of Mekorot, does that translate into pilots, into demonstrations? All the way out, starting with academia, all the research, TRL between 0 to 2, then practical research of all academias in Israel, that is from TRL 2 to 4, then comes the pilots or the labs, the solutions that we are testing, TRL 4 to 6, and going up to TRLs 10, we are covering all the water cycle innovation chain. I guess that defines pretty well the Nikos system. You mentioned how Mekorot was created in 1937. When did the topic of water resilience become prominent? From day zero, always we were struggling. When we started, there were only 600,000 people in Israel or Palestine prior to Israel. So we were supplying only through local wells. We were growing rapidly. We are immigrant countries. We were trying to move fast in order to reach the demand. But within water resilience, what I understand is that's not just planning for the day you're at, but also planning for the future. Exactly. And you started with a big challenge because you had to build something and to cope with the immigrant country, which Israel is. So how do you ensure that you stay ahead and you have that advancing phase so that you're having a clear sight of the future. I will give you one example about the system of Jerusalem that tells the old story. 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, Jerusalem was isolated. The source of water was local. Reservoirs that were taking water during the winter and supplied all over the year. Then started with the mandatory with the British, the UK, a line, first line or second line. To Jerusalem, it was not enough. We put in place the third line to Jerusalem, it was not enough. Always with a bigger diameter, always thinking that the new line will stay for 50, 70 years, 100 years. It's a joke. Never. Then come the fourth line. The fourth line was during the 90s. And we thought that this line will be enough for the next 50 years, at least the next 50 years, you know? We started the fifth line in 2005, and we hope that this line, which is a huge one, 100 inch and with big station, 13.5 kilometer of tunnel in the mountains, that this line will support us for the next 100 years. I will tell you frankly, I don't think so. <laughs> we will have to build the next one. But the vision was always that we are building the solution for the next generation. But there are surprises. You can ask, so why you didn't b build initially in the 19 or, or the 70s, the third and the fourth line a, a, as a 100 inch line? You always, there's a balance between the investment and the economy. Mm -hmm. You can't build the, for a, a line forever. What you're mentioning here with the costs is a very good transition to the full residence topic because I'm a water engineer. When I was taught about engineering, we were looking at curves which were telling us that is an event which might occur every 100 years, every 1,000 years, every 10,000 years. And then you had a guideline from the government telling you that you will build that for a 100-year event. So you build for that. But what that doesn't anticipate for is climate change. With climate change, the 100 events becomes maybe a 50-year or 30-year event, which means that now your full infrastructure is under design. And in 2023, so last year, we've seen terrible events in Turkey, in Morocco, in Greece, in Libya, and I'm forgetting many more. And those showed us how sensible it is and how difficult it is to design our infrastructure and to rebuild our infrastructure in these kind of events. Where should we start from a water utility perspective? What is the first thing we should look at in light of these new challenges posed by climate change? This is the most important and the biggest challenge of every utility, water utility nowadays. Climate change, it's aggressive. You have to think differently. And some CEOs of water utility always speak about innovation, but in, when you are listening carefully, they are not speaking about innovation. They are speaking about resilience because they would like to implement solution that will support them to be more resilient. And this is the big challenge. You were speaking about this crisis. So thinking about Greece last year, 600 millimeter of rainfall 
within 24 hours, it's a huge amount of water. There is no water system that can collect it. So now we are coming with a balance. You will never build a water system, a collection of sewers for 600 millimeter water in a one day because you will have expenditure of a huge amount of money and mm -hmm. will not be able to use your finance on the right way for providing solution to your customers. So you have to do some kind of risk management. And you will say loud and clear that when you were thinking about one event in 100 years, no way. It will be one event in five or 10 or 20 years. This is the reality. It is changing dramatically. All the engineering calculation, not worth the paper that they are writing on anymore. We have very aggressive events and we shall find some way to mitigate the events, but not the most extreme ones. We can't. How do you set the bar? How do you define where to put the threshold? I can say from my point of view that I shall be prepared to 150 millimeter rainfall a day in Israel. Why? Because the reason that I saw it in the last 10 years, at least 10 times in different places in the coastal places in Israel. We faced it. 600 millimeter is taking all our investment budget for new pipes, new public station, new water treatment plant, new wastewater treatment plant, and all this in order to mitigate 600 millimeter. It doesn't make sense. You always should do some kind of risk management so it will be 600 millimeter. I will suffer several days, but I will cover. You're based on your data, which says that you have 10 times occurrences, 150 millimeter in Israel. So that's what you designed for. Yet I would bet that was 150 are up to what you were seeing 10 or 20 years ago. It's, it's probably more extreme. So how does Mekorot roll out a plan inside Israel to deal with those new challenges? First of all, there will be issues with electricity very hot days and very cold days. So we are building independent capabilities to supply electricity to our air plants. It means more and more use of self diesel generators with ability to store fuel for at least five to 10 days in our facility. There will be an earthquake. We have a very big and strong earthquake in the, our region every 100 years. We are there, we will face it in the coming years, we are taking into consideration that might we will not be able to move. There will be big damages to our plant. So we have a plan to enforce enforcement of our plant, of our cement pools, our pumping station, our line. We are putting in place on-site chlorination for our 50% of the drinking water supply. Is a new plan for the coming years. We were speaking about the generators. We are putting in place many reserves pumps in many places. The way that we are using in our system five sources of water is very good. We have the desalinated water of the sea that might suffer from tsunamis, but if they will not work, I will have the Sea of Galilee as the surface water. I have the groundwater and I have the reclaimed water and I have two sources of groundwater. This is the way. If someone that is coming from a country that depends only on one source of water, I would tell him that he is in a big risk, in a very big risk. What I'm taking home so far is the last thing you said about balanced sources, ensure that you don't put all your eggs in the same basket. Exactly. That makes a ton of sense. And what you were saying before is basically it will happen. There will be big natural events. But when it happens, you need to ensure that your service continuity is guaranteed as much as possible and at least that you return to high services as fast as possible. I was just reading a report from the IPCC, which was demonstrating that there's one thing which is natural event, but the consequences of the natural events are even worse than the natural event itself. So it means more diseases like diarrhea, cholera, extreme cases like that, because sanitation is shut off and so far and so on. If I understand you right, your role as the National Water Company is to say, we can't prevent climate change from happening. We can't prevent natural events from happening, but we can plan so that when it statistically will happen, we will as fast as possible return to normal level of services. Exactly. You said that the will and most important thing. I assume that even with a very big earthquake with magnitude of more than seven, four, seven, five, seven, six, there will be real mess in Israel. But our role is to be full back in somehow, let's say 60 to 70 to 80 or 90% 
of capabilities within days, not weeks, within days. This is our target. It will be a chaos. We understand that it will be a chaos, but we shall recover as soon as we can. This is our target. We should be there and we should be prepared. And this is the thing that we are doing to be prepared. On February last year, we have in one day several issues. First of all, there was the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. February. So there are several places in Israel that dozens of wells were out of operation because of turbidity. First thing. Secondly, we are in February. February is not a, a month with a lot of demand. It means that all the maintenance work of the national carrier is being done on February. So we were cut down with our parts of our national carrier. But on the same day, we had a big storm in the sea, not related to the earthquake. Big storm, winter, Barbara storm it was called, because I remember. And this storm caused a shutdown of four of the five big mega destination plants of the seashore. So imagine, we do not have wells, we do not have the main national carrier, we do not have the seawater desalination plant that supplies 60% of the drinking water of Israel daily. So we were using, in a good way, groundwater, and there was one desalination plant that was still in operation, and we were overcoming this disaster, I can say disaster, within 24 hours. This is the reality. We will face different events that might come together and create some bad synergy between events. And this is the one thing that we should be prepared for. That's where I'd like to understand the role you want to play in the future, because you've explained how from day zero, resilience was part of what you've been building. So that means you have this advance. You said 10 years of advance. I would give you more of advance, honestly. But you say 10 years, let's say 10 years. How do you want to play those cards? Are you envisioning to be like an advisor for other places or geographies? Or do you want to proactively not only advise, but also act upon the advice? What's your vision there? Very good question. And I will tell you something. I'm trying to learn from my mistakes, but also from other places in the world mistakes. We never a public or governmental utilities tried to be an EPC company in other places in the world. They failed. It is not the culture of a public or national or federal utility. It's a different culture. We are very good in operation. We are very good in building our systems. It is not a big uh, advantage to compete with the private market, with the thousands of EPCs, thousands of finance firms that are providing the money to the projects. All utilities from, I will not say the countries, not to offend anyone, but many places in the world, national water companies try to go overseas for projects and fail. So what is the big advantage? Is the know-how. Taking the know-how and implement it in other places in the world. If you have some know-how of a water supply, take it and implement it. If you know how to build master plan on the right way to province, to states, to a federal level, suggest it. If you know how to suggest how to operate more efficient, take it and train it other people. This is our message. We are not going to compete. Any EPC companies, any supplier of, of equipment, we would like to consult, design, and train. This is our strength. When you say you would like, does that mean you've already started rolling that out? Yes. Or is it in the future? No, we started and we have a big success. It's amazing. We started with a limitation of numbers from our government and we reached these numbers within years. And now we are doing more and more. And we asked the government, if, for example, if they gave us the permit to work for a $1 a year, we'd like to work five or ten dollars because we have the capacity and we have the need in other places of the world countries are calling us come and advise us put in place our master plans would you have a concrete example to share yes for example we are working in the last two years with argentina you said your neighbors argentina is a bit no. stretch considering no, neighbors no, <laughs> i'm thinking about our neighbors we are, we are working in argentina in seven provinces we did a great job in providing the master plan how to control and how to operate better their air water resources. And nowadays with the new regime, they would like us to double the number of provinces. And we will do so. Asking about your, our neighbors. We were the first uh, company that is, uh, were working in Bahrain. We did a very, very good project there. We were designing a seawater desalination plant 
that they can use the design and now tender it. Moreover, because we are a unique expertise in brackish water desalination inland, we were suggesting them and we are designing a brackish water desalination plant that is very good for emergency situation whenever you have some problem with the sea. And I'm sure that in the coming years, they will use it to tenderize it. We were doing a project for command and control and a little bit with cyber, with cyber security. It was a great project. I think working with Morocco, but it stopped according to the situation. I'm sure that in the coming years, it's coming again. We are supplying water to Jordan and we are ready to supply more and more. And if Jordan will ask us some advice how to use better the water system, we will do it with pleasure. There are no border for water. Water should be the bridge for peace. And we are ready to work with everybody in the region. We were ready to work with all our neighbors, not as a patronize, but work together to build better system for the region. It would be a business relationship. You're, you are acting as a consultant. So it's not like neocolonialism. It's really like... No you're... way, no way. Business consulting to provide them the ability to work better in their countries. Taking our very good experience over the years, we will not be colonized or patronized of anyone. Always we are saying when we are going to other countries, we are not coming to give you a lesson. We are coming to work with you. We are trying to be modest a little bit. You have a clear expertise in some technical fields like desalination, arid system management, and a lot of the elements you mentioned so far. I'm wondering, one part of this resilience building is around nature-based solutions. Is it also something you're looking into? Or would you say, no, that's, I mean, nature-based solutions, if you're in Ireland, is different than if you're in Israel. So maybe let's leave that to the green countries. No, we are not giving up a, a natural solution, by the way. Still, we think that our Groundwater is a source that we shall keep. The only surface water source, Lake of Galilee, is very important. This is the reason that we put in place new things, a new approach, taking artificial water and supply it to a natural water source. The reverse national carrier. It's a new thinking, different thinking. Lake of Galilee is the only surface water source. It's a place that all the people of Israel are coming in the summer, in the winter, and would like to enjoy it. It is a source of water for emergency situations. Whenever the level of the Sea of Galilee is dropping down, the people in Israel are getting upset. Whenever it is up like this year, they are very happy. So it's part of our culture. And the most important thing, whenever you are Christians, you need to see Galilee because Jesus walk on the water. If you lose this place, it will be very upsetting all the Christian people over the world. We are nowadays trying to come alive the rivers again, as it was in the past. There is a flow of water in many rivers that 10 years ago were dry. In this project of the reverse national carrier, at the end of the project, we are putting the water in a river that flow to the Lake of Galilee. This is a river that is, was dry and now is alive. And people are coming and swimming and walking through the river. It's amazing. You mentioned the culture. There's one thing in the culture of Israel when it comes to water, which is always surprising when you look at that from, from abroad, but which goes back to the socialist roots of the country, which is the way water belongs to the state. And then the state relocate the water. And in retrospect, that's, in my opinion, very forward-looking. Did you see other countries which wanted to have a similar approach? Or are you a bit the lone ranger on that one? I would tell you something. There's other places like Singapore and others that the water belongs to the government and, and the state, not the government, the state. So, so you're listing all the good pupils. So yeah. basically, there's a common trait. All the ones which have that system are also the most advanced water systems in the world. So maybe there's something to learn here. I would tell you something. I was an event seven years ago in Washington, D.C. There were three panels about conflict around water. One of them was the Middle East here in Israel with the Palestinians that were speaking together. The first one, second one was the Mississippi River, and the last one was the Colorado. And we are the first. So when we, we were talking about the conflict here, the people that were on the stage were experts in water from Palestinian side, from the Israeli side, and everything. We were talking about technology, about engineering. The next two sessions were all only lawyers. You know why? Because in the U.S., you are talking about the water rights which is a big mess. And they know that it is a big mess. The most important 
thing that our leaders, the beginning of the country did is the water law. In 1959, the water law says that every drop of water, every drop of source of water belong to the state. And the state, more important thing, what kind of water? They stated clearly that the salinated water, artificial water, and wastewater also belong to the state. Imagine 1959, no wastewater plants of uh, activated sludge, no reclaimed water system in place, but still wastewater and reclaimed water belong to the state. This is a big, big, big advantage that we had all over the years. Places that not thinking in the same way are losing the control of the water system. I think it's a lesson of how to be forward-looking. In some weeks from now, we will be in London for the Global Water Summit, and you will be running a workshop on water sector resilience. What are the three main topics which you will bring up in that workshop? To be, by the way, they be a great event and great speakers, and I'm objective. I would like to say we will focus on three tiers of this issue, even four, I can say. First of all, the perspective of the utilities. They will be on the stage in one panel, several utilities from different places in the world that speak about their lessons. I know who is the moderator. I'm sure that it will be a very good moderator. It's me. <laughs> uh, 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 this is one thing. Secondly, we will show a case study of one of the experts of extreme event from Israel that is working all over the world today. Not in the water necessarily, but we speak about water also. He will speak about the human factor. When always we are speaking about extreme situations and we are speaking about disasters, we are speaking about how much machine will we have, how much lines, how much electricity, and we do not speak about the human factor, the ability to take the right decisions, the stress. The human factor is one of the most important things in order to be on the successful side and not about the one that failed. Last and not least, of course, we're talking about technology. We would like to be able to overcome extreme events, disasters. You have to put in place technology about your core engineering. And do it split to two. First of all, deep technology solutions. There will be the giant that like Xylem and Swiss that we speak about their capabilities. Also, micro digital revolution. And the second thing that we we'll speak there in the same panel is that we will bring innovation. Early stage companies that comes with solution to extreme events. So we will cover all aspects of utilities, the human factor, digital solutions, and innovation. It's all things that come together and create the right synergy for the solutions. And of course, round table that we will discuss all things that we were speaking in the panels. Looking forward to see you there. I have a tricky question for that because yes. I'm forbidding you to answer me everyone. So you can't answer everyone who should come and participate in the series of panels, workshop, roundtables, which you just listed? First of all, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no. To be frank, I would like to see, first of all, the utilities, because the perspective of the utilities is the most important things. And I think that there is no wisdom in one place. The wisdom can be taken from all other places. And we are taking the lesson from Greece, Turkey. Philippines, Morocco, Libya, Japan, and our places. So the discussion between utilities is the most important thing. I would like to see the supplier, the providers of solutions that can meet these challenges. I would like to see the innovation side. If the innovative solution, if it's digital or core engineering solution, I would like to see them. Companies that are coming with a new approach to this climate change extreme events. And one thing that is very important, I would like to see the consulting firm. The consulting firms are very important because they are the backbones of every water utility. They are the ones that bring in the solution for the development and the investment budget of each utility. They shall understand clearly what is the challenge and they shall speak the same language of their customers, which are the utilities. Okay, you cannot cheat it because you didn't say everybody, but still you, you listed me everybody. So I guess I get the message. I can say that the industrial water side is welcome, but is not necessarily welcome. Okay, uh, fair enough. At least one pair that we are not speaking about. <laughs> That's a good one. I have a last question for you in that deep dive, which is a bit of a crystal ball question. You explained 
what you want and can bring in that full element of building water resilience, building the approach and the water management of the future. Now, if we look down the line, let's say 10 years, what do you aim to build in 10 years? What's the role of Mekorot in that new water paradigm in, in 10 years? And what will tell you personally that you had an impact? Wow. I'm going to put in place a, a new plan for my growth of being uh, balanced with the energy used in the company. It means to offset our energy use with, let's say, the year of 2050. It's a huge challenge because we do not operate so many wastewater cleaner plants, so that we do not have the biogas as part of the reduction of emissions. But I think that there will be a change, and we have to be part of this change. More green energy, if it's a PV or a hydroelectrics, we do not have the wind. The wind is not so important here. Other thing that I would think that create a change is the huge of hydrogen. Instead of fossil energy sources and production of hydrogen from the water, from reclaimed water. So not using fresh water in order to provide this hydrogen. Hydrogen is one of the things that will be the next revolution. And I would like to be there. And it will help us to offset our energy emissions. And for you personally? I will create and build the Innovation R&D Center of Mekorot that will be a national one that will deal with all the aspects that we were speaking in the last 55 minutes. That would be a great impact. That's a good yes. good target, I guess. Yes. Yossi, it's been a pleasure to have that deep dive with you. To round off these interviews, I'm having a list of rapid fire questions. So if that's fine with you, I'd switch to that last section. It's time for the rapid fire questions. What is the most exciting project you've been working on and why? The most exciting projects it's fifth line to Jerusalem. I came to the project as a upper project management at the end of the project. At the point that they should deliver water. And you know, we never delivered water from the sea level to 800 meter up to Jerusalem, which is the mountains, to a 13.5 kilometer of tunnel of 102 inches with huge pumping stations and to create a solution and to see that it is working that is solving the water problem of Jerusalem for the next 50 years it's amazing it's a real vision that come together and I was not the one that started this project I was at the end of this project I was being at the end when you are pushing the button and the water is flowing and you know it's the first time that we're supplying the salinated water to Jerusalem I can imagine can you name one thing that you've learned the hard way we were building the uh, and operating the only governmental seawater desalination plant and we failed at the end of the day it was a good project that we started in the right price but it was not a successful project. And how did you overcome the failure? Uh, we got a very good price when we solved the project and we learned our lesson, as I said, don't do things that is not your main expertise. That's a very good piece of advice. Is there something you're doing today in your job that you will not be doing in 10 years? Yes, using papers, only digital issues. I will be a, a, a fully paperless. I'm almost there, but with 10 years, it will be sure. What is the trend to watch out for in the water sector? Zero emissions for sure, to find the, finally a solution for brine, less brine and extracts minerals from brine. And of course, wastewater as a source for drinking water, valid source of drinking water or of the water, after treatment, of course. And all the digital revolution, using AI and machine learning in order to be better in the way that you operate your system, maintenance your system with much less employees. That's four, but I would subscribe to the four. I keep it. If I instantly became your assistant, what's the number one task that you delegate to me that would help you out in your job? And I never promised I would do it. One thing, enforce me to be more digital guy. And I am a digital guy. More, more and more. Use more and more advanced solution on my core engineering capabilities. Last question. Would you have someone to recommend me that I should definitely invite on that microphone? Always I like the way that Manu Alterman is working with the Knights. He's a great guy. On the Dutch side of the industry, they're doing great, great things all over for many years. And I think that from PUB Singapore, it will be very good. They're doing a great job there. I should not say that because it's going to bring me bad vibes. But I was in talks with the chief of staff of, of Mino yesterday. Yeah. So 
that interview should happen at some point. We, we had a short one already, but I want to have a long form with him. So thanks for the recommendation. Yossi, if people want to follow up with you, what's the best way for them to do so? Is it to come and attend your workshop at the Global Water Summit or send you a mail, reach out to you on LinkedIn? Whenever people are reaching to me to the LinkedIn, I'm, I'm coming back to them with less than 10 hours, even five, sometimes three hours. Of course, coming to the workshop would be good. I would be uh, pleased to chat with the people on the one-on-one -on -one platform that will be in the middle of March. And on my email, I'm always 24-7, capable to take and answer any question, any thought. And if we would like to work together, to be most my pleasure. As always, if you're listening to this or watching this, check out the description. All the links to what Yossi just shared are there. So make sure to reach out on LinkedIn and to come see the workshop and the one-on-one -on -one session. Yossi, it's been a pleasure to have you on. I hope to continue that discussion at some point in London. We left many doors open. I'm sure there's much more to, to dig, especially on the innovation side. You got me hooked with your R&D and, and innovation national center. I think that's really something I'd be keen to learn more about. So you have to be back at some point for today. Thanks a lot. It was a great interview from my point of view. I enjoyed it. <laughs> so thank you being a, a, a very nice moderator of this interview. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for listening to Don't Waste Water. This podcast was brought to you by GF Piping Systems. Loved this episode? Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. See you next time.